Hi everyone, uh, my name is Maika, and as James introduced, I will be talking about optimally disrupting opponent buildups. Um, and this is joint work with Peter Robrecht, Luc de Raad, and Jesse Davis at KU Leuven in Belgium. So first, a bit about me, who am I? I am a PhD student at the DJI Sports Analytics Lab in KU Leuven in Belgium. And my main focus is on applying machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques on football data to automatically extract some tactical insights from it. Besides that, I'm also an avid football player myself. I play as a right back, so build-ups are a big part of my game. And yeah, I definitely would like to know how people could disrupt them. So let's talk about build-up play. So um, as most of you know, build-up play is the phase of the game in which the team has possession of the ball and tries to score while the opponent is in an organized defense. Um, and it's one of the most structured phases of play in soccer, so it often starts with a defender in possession of the ball and all other players in front of it. And the goal of the attacking team is then to break the opposition's first line of pressure and to progress the play into the next phases. And because it's such a structured phase of play, teams often create some controlled passing sequences or movements to do this. So, for example, here, we have the fullback underlap, in which the center back played the ball to the fullback, who then sends it up the wing and takes off running upfield. So here again, the center back plays it to the fullback, sends it up the wing, and takes off running upfield. And this is one example of how such a buildup could play out. Now then, on the other hand, the goal of the defenders is to then actually stop this attack in this initial phase, or to disrupt it to minimize its threat. And by optimally positioning themselves, they can actually force the opponent to play the ball in an unfamiliar or inefficient way. So if we can automatically extract or um, detect these build-up plays of teams and look at uh, or identify the locations that they like to use the most or the directness of style of play, we can then give pointers to the defensive team on how to optimize themselves. And we can create plans on how they should organize them to actually stop these attacks in this initial stage. So if we take the fullback underlap again, we can actually take this red defender here and push him into this gap. And this actually then prevents the, um, the fullback from running upfield. So then the attacking team is actually forced to play the ball backwards again. And this is just one way of how this uh, buildup could be disrupted. Um, so ideally, what we would like to know is to do, like how to do this optimally for any type of buildup for any team. So like I said, if we could automatically identify these buildup patterns of teams, this could already help us. It could help us to support these tactical analyses and help us to formulate plans to stop the opponent's attacks in this initial stage. So here we've identified the most likely sequence that Barcelona used during their last season, and it's just going straight through the center. So we could devise some defensive strategy against this and employ it. However, what will happen is that Barcelona, or the attacking team in general, will just use other patterns instead. Um, so here we can see many of the other patterns that were used by Barcelona during the last season. Um, and we couldn't possibly devise a defensive strategy against each one of these patterns. That's just impossible. So ideally, what we would like to do is to go beyond this and answer the general question of which defensive setup is most effective to disrupt a team's buildup. And this is a much higher level question than just looking at the patterns and looking at how to disrupt each one of them. So specific questions you might want to ask are, is pressing high or sitting low better to avoid long balls? Or is it more optimal to direct the play to the left or the right flank? And you can ask many more questions like this. Um, however, answering these questions is not that straightforward. Um, first, you need to reason about the different ways that possession sequence could actually turn out. And second, these questions are also somewhat counterfactual in a sense that you need to reason about what could have happened if you had done things differently. So these are two challenges that we need to deal with. So we need a way to reason about these buildups, these defensive setups, and these challenges. Um, and this is actually what we proposed in this work. So we propose a model for identifying the buildup strategies, and then we incorporate into the model how a team reacts to a defensive setup. 
And next, we then show how this model can be used to reason about the optimal defensive strategies to actually disrupt these buildups. So what does this model look like? Well, it's a Markov decision process for buildups. And this may remind you of the works of Sarah Rudd, Karun Singh, who talked two years ago, and Derek Young. And they also created like similar models, these Markov models um, for soccer. So basically what these models do is they depict how a team behaves or moves the ball over the field during a possession sequence. Could be a general possession sequence, could be buildups, as we will use it for in this work. So let me give a quick recap of what these models do or what they look like. So given the current game state, and this is typically just the current location of the ball, here discretized into different zones or states. So given this current game state or current location of the ball, they allow a team to make certain actions. So typically we have a general move action that moves the ball to any of the other states and a shoot action, so shooting on goal. Then the policy of the model actually determines the probability of you choosing each of these actions. So for example, 97% choosing the move action in a certain state and 3% choosing the uh, shoot action in a certain state. Then the transition function actually determines the probability of that chosen action being successful. And all these probabilities can be readily extracted from the data itself. So for example, from event stream data. And then finally, a Markov model also allows to specify rewards for transitions. So here in soccer terms, that just means that we get a reward of one when we score a goal. And this whole thing then just depicts how a team behaves over the field during a possession sequence. What we did in earlier work this year at Sloan is that we changed this general move action to a move to action. Um, so here we include the intended end location of a certain pass into the model. And what this allowed us to do was to actually analyze the decision making of teams. Um, so in this work, we used it to analyze the shooting decision making, but in this work, it can also be used to analyze the buildups. Now what we also need to analyze buildups and the defensive structures is actually those defensive structures, right? We need to also include in the model the given defensive setup that was used by these opponents and also more uh, fine-grained information about the reachable teammates. So who was reachable and who was blocked at each state of the game. And that's actually what we include in this work. So previously, it wasn't possible to include this, but now with the Stasbomb 360 data, it includes snapshots of player positioning for every action. So now it is actually possible to include this information. Um, so this data allows us to extract the defensive structure at each action and also the reachable teammate information. So where the reachable teammates were positioned on the field. And then we can include this information into the model. How do we include it? Well, we have these two types of data that we want to add. So we also create two types of models. And additionally, they also allow for a different kind of analysis. So let me explain this. Um, so the first type of model that we create is a location-based MDP. So in the states themselves, we only take into account the current location of the ball. But we create one such MDP for each defensive setup. And I'll explain what those are later. But what this MDP allows us to do is to actually analyze it and analyze the global defensive setup of teams. Then next, the next type of MDP actually extends these previous ones with reachable teammate information into each state. And this then allows us to do a more fine-grained analysis of player positioning. All right, so let's now create these models. The first thing we need to do is to extract the buildup sequences from the data. So we take those sequences in which the defender has possession of the ball and there's no offensive pressure on him. Next, we split these buildup sequences into different sets based upon uh, the defensive setup that they were played against. And this could be derived from the Statsbomb 360 data. So we have four defensive setups that we looked at, um, here depicted in these two figures. So in the left figure, you can see a high block. Um, and this is depicted by the red dots. Those are the defending players playing from right to left. So you can see that they're pretty high up the field, depicting a high block. 
Then in the right figure, you can see that the red dots are a bit closer to their own goal, depicting a low block. And next, we also have a left forcing and a right forcing block. What we mean by this is in the left figure, you see a left forcing block because the blue attacking team is forced to their own left hand side. Whereas in the right figure, you can see that they're forced to play the ball to their own right hand side. So if we take the available Stasbomb 360 data for the Spanish uh, La Liga and the German Bundesliga for the top 10 teams, and we do all of this, we get about 1,000 build-up sequences of varying lengths for each of these defensive setups. So once we have this data, we can actually construct these models. So the first thing we do is we construct one location-based MDP per defensive setup. The data are obviously these extracted build-up sequences, and the states in this one are just defined by their location on the pitch. And specifically, we use these 30 states here depicted in this figure. Um, and the rest of the Markov model is actually just created, as I explained earlier, with the move to action and shooting and extracting the probabilities from, from the data itself. Then the extended MDP actually includes the teammate reachability. So here, the states themselves are no longer just defined by their location on the pitch, but also by teammate reachability. So by four, binary addi four additional binary features per location-based state. Um, and what those four binary features tell us is that there is or is not a reachable player, for example, on your left-hand side, your right-hand side, in front of you, or behind you. Um, so these four colored patches that you see here on the slide. Um, and these patches are then also created relative to the ball carrier. So they differ for each action. How do we actually determine whether there is a player that is reachable or not? Well, we look at the teammates and we look at the proximity of opponents to those teammates. So if they're too close to your, to your teammates, so for example, within a radius of 1.5 meters, your teammate is no longer reachable or if they're in proximity to passing lanes, so if they're too close to the passing lane, um, they're able to intercept the ball, and then your teammate is also no longer reachable. All right, so once we have those models, we can actually start the analysis. So the first thing we can do is obviously look at the most likely build-up sequences that the team has used according to the model. So um, here on top, we see for Barcelona, both under a high block and a low block, their most used sequences. And we see that they tend to go through the center first and then move to the sides, and preferably to the left side. If we then go back and look at the data, we actually see that this is often Piquet passing to Busquets, passing to Frankie Dio. And the same analysis can be made, for example, for Real Madrid um, at the bottom. There we see something different. We actually see that they prefer moving through the left side first. And you can create these analyses for any type of team. Um, and while they are already interesting, we would actually like to go beyond this and actually look at how to optimally disrupt their buildups instead of just looking at their, their sequences. So how do we do this? Well, there is a technique in the field of artificial intelligence called probabilistic verification. What this method actually allows us to do is to um, apply it to the model and analyze what's happening inside the model. So in this case, it will allow us to help analyze the buildup efficiency of teams. And we define this efficiency as a probability of reaching the final third of the pitch. So this probabilistic verification actually just allows us to calculate this probability. Um, and as a defending team, you obviously want to decrease this probability. So what we want to do is to analyze this model under different circumstances to find the best one uh, to use. So you could ask some questions about this efficiency under these different circumstances. For example, the first one, does letting them start their buildup from their left or right side yield lower efficiency? Or is actively forcing them to move the ball to their left or right side better? Or you could go even further and look at the reachable teammate information and ask questions about whether blocking all players on the center backs' left side would be a good way to disrupt it. And you can ask many more questions like this under many more circumstances. But I'll explain our results for just these three questions. So let's start with the first one. Is letting them start from their left or right side better? 
So here we want to identify the side from which, if the team starts their buildup there, they're less efficient if they do this. Um, so here we show the results for Atletico, Granada, and Real. So if you're playing against this team, both under a high block in the left column and under a low block in the right column, and then starting from their own left or right hand side. And these probabilities show how much the defending team can actually decrease the other team's buildup efficiency by employing these strategies. So here in the results, we see that regardless of the block structure, letting Real start from their right side decreases the buildup efficiency the most. And remember, I showed those frequently used uh, buildup sequences of Real. There they use their left side the most. And here we do actually see that, yeah, forcing them to, well, letting them start on their right side is actually better. Then for Granada, we see actually that switching sides between these blocks is actually needed. So we see that we should let them start from their right side under a high block, but from their left side under a low block. And this switching size between these blocks is actually not that common. We only saw it happen for three out of the 20 teams uh, that we analyzed. And then for other teams, like for example here Atletico, um, the difference between these blocks and sides is not that big, so it doesn't really matter where you let them start their buildups. All right, we could go a bit further than this and start looking at how to, um, what happens if we actively force them to move the ball to a certain side, instead of just letting them start somewhere. So here we see the results for the top three teams in the Spanish La Liga last season, Atletico, Barcelona, and Real, under this left and right forcing block that I explained earlier. Um, so here we see for Barcelona, there's actually no real difference in forcing them to either side. Um, but we do see, for example, again for Real, forcing them to their right side is a good idea. And here for Atletico, we do see a difference. Um, and we see that forcing them to their left side is actually a good thing to do. Finally, we could zoom in a bit more than just these high level defensive structures and actually look at the reachable teammate information that is available in these extended models. So this allows us to ask questions of like whether blocking all players on a center back's left or right side would be a better idea. So what do we mean by blocking players on a certain side? Well, if you block players on a center back's left side, this means in the left figure that we do not allow a reachable teammate in the patch with the red cross. And the same thing for blocking players on their right side in the right figure. So if we then look at the results, again, for the top three in the Spanish La Liga last season, um, both under a high block and a low block, we see that it's generally best to block players on Barcelona's and Real's right side. Um, and here for Atletico, we again do see a difference and we see that it's best to block the players on their left side under a low block, but on their right side under a high block. So in summary, what these analyses allow us to do or what these analyses can tell us is for example for Barcelona, that they're most likely to go through the center, which we can get from the pads, that forcing them to either side actually won't make a big difference, but that blocking the players on the center backs' right side and using a high block might. And you can create these analyses and summaries for any team, really. So to conclude, we proposed a model for identifying the build-up strategies and then incorporated into the model how the team reacts to a defensive setup. And this could be done by using the new added context in the StatsBomb360 data. And then we showed how this model can be used to actually reason about the optimal defensive strategies to disrupt the team's buildups. Thanks.